So I think everybody who's here got their assignment posted on Slack, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah. So any problems? I was stuck on like something for like two hours until I realized like, oh, hey, I unchecked this, and then I just wanted to close the entire computer. Well, what were you stuck on? Oh, uh, okay. So just a me problem, but <laughs> it was fun. That happens. Brandon, did your homework go all right? Cool, let's see how everybody else was doing here from 
online. And we get to meet any, everybody in addition to our Slack introductions that everyone did last week. Here's Cheska. To auto save our work. And um, in Unity, Unity, I tried, I tried looking, looking around, around for an auto save option, option, but I couldn't, couldn't find, find it. it. So, so is, is there, there a way, way to back up our files in Unity just, just in case anything, anything happens? happens? That's a good question. Um, saving, so I mean, part of the problem there is that Unity isn't just one file, as we all know now. But you would be saving just the scene file. I don't think there's a preference for it, but there's a bunch of third party tools. I'll have to do a little bit deeper dive to see if any of them are recommendable. I'll try and let you know on Wednesday there. But it's not quite as simple of a solution since Unity is not just one file. You've got this whole folder to deal with. That's Cheska. Here's Rocio. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Um, um, my question will be about how to add pictures as an external file to an object. I need like pictures, pictures because I remember that in the same for the you can do that, but then you have to adjust the photo to, to make it look uh, right, right because it can be weird sometimes. And um, yeah, yeah, how can I do that in Unity? And also, and also, is there another way to use the camera to adjust it that is not using the position and rotation point for social? Okay, well, we, we covered the second thing, right? What's an easier way to position the camera? What if I want the camera to look like there? Remember, this is not the camera, right? This is called the what over here. Go ahead. Scene. You're going to say scene view, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, of course, scene view, right, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, what's the shortcut to have the game view match the scene view? It's control shift F, very close, right? But you need to make sure you have the camera selected. And then the control shift F, that one, is move the object to the scene view. And so, uh, in this case, with the camera selected, I can move to where I want it, and then with it selected, Control Shift F, now it's over there, right? So this is how I almost always position the camera, almost every time, right? Everybody getting used to the navigation here with Alt, left click, Alt, middle mouse button, Alt, right mouse button? Cool. Um, and then Rocio took 184 with me, and she's correct. And help me out with your name again. Isaac, right. Isaac figured this out in the homework. So how did you put a picture on the ball? Um, I did two things. I either uh, opened one of my files, or I right-clicked and selected one. So, and you put it on the material. Yeah, so if this is a material here, we'll go with some sort of, we'll just call it image texture for now. And so here's a material, and last week we did this, we were able to make different colors. But next to each parameter on a material, we're gonna get into this in way more detail, but you know, there's a color, meaning like all of the surface is the same color, and then there's metallic and smoothness, but each of these things also has a map input here, meaning that you can load um, any kind of texture or image in there. Now, how it 
is displayed across the pixels of the image, across the surface of the image, uh, can change. But without getting into that too much, let's grab an image of some kind. Here we go. So we'll get into this in more detail, but I've got two here we can use. All right, so I have this uh, rock boulder. I'll drag this in here. This is a, should be a PNG. Let's just verify that. I'll right click and go to properties. Yeah, it's a PNG file. So any PNG or TIFF file is going to work in this instance. And so how do we apply this to this? We want to apply it to the material, right? So this gets applied to this, and this gets applied to this. And so we'll select the material here. I'll drag it over to this input. Or you can click on this, and it opens up the, here, let's remove this one. If you click on the tiny circle right here, right there, this will open up the file browser if you want to load it that way or drag from there onto there. If I click there, you see it shows everything that it could possibly apply. And now, let's not make it red. So you can still use the color and it kind of multiplies them, but we'll just make it white so we have the actual texture. And now I can drag this onto here and it looks like rock, kind of, um, on there, right? So this is an image that's specifically designed to be a texture. One really quick thing, since I have it here, a blue one. Again, we'll go over this in way more detail, but um, anytime you see this blue, you can write this down in your notes right now, start memorizing it. This is a normal map. Normal map is going to make the surface look uh, bumpy in a specific way. So I can drag this in there as well. And the same material, not a new material, you'll look, there is a input here for normal map. Right? So anytime you take an image, picture, and apply it to geometry like this, you're usually using the term map, right? So map is not a file type. It's not like a .map file. You take a PNG or a TIFF, and you apply it to a material that gets applied to geometry, and you sort of refer to it as a map at that point. And so this normal map can go in our normal map spot. Give it a second. Now, normal maps, we'll get into exactly how they work later, but the short story is Unity needs to know that this is not just another image, that this is a normal map, or else it won't treat it quite right. You see, it did do something. Like our, it kind of looks different, right? We got some, looks bumpier somehow, but it looks way, it's all of a sudden really, really dark down here because it's not quite calculating it right. Fortunately now, as soon as you drag a normal map onto the normal channel here, and you haven't properly processed it, Unity prompts you. And it says like, hey, you haven't said this thing is a normal map. And it gives you the super convenient button to, yes, fix now. And once we do that, ah, much better, right? So now we're able to see what happens. Here, I'll, I'll put the normal map, watch the, this is like the eye doctor, watch the sphere on the left. Uh, here is no normal map. Here is normal map. Big difference, right? We are not changing the geometry. So the mesh is unaltered. They're just changing the way that the light interacts 
and we're doing it per pixel since we're storing all that pixel information in the normal map. So those two things there, when you find textures online or make them yourselves, inevitably they'll have some sort of color and some sort of normal map that allows the surface to be much more detailed, much bumpier, you know, there's way more detail there in that. Uh, and then there's a number right next to it. That's the one I was changing. And if you I wish they did a better job of showing us where that happens. I don't know why there's not a slider for that. Regardless, these ones have sliders here. This one just has a value. And so you could turn this up or down. Right, so here it is at 0 with doing nothing. Here it is at 0.1, just a tiny bit of surface up and down. Here it is at 1. This is kind of the standard value. And you could turn it up some more. What if I said 2? OK, that's more dramatic. But you can tell, like, OK, now the bottom's really dark. and it's starting to look a little strange. At 3, OK, that's really quite dramatic. If I put it up at like 10, right, you can see how this starts to break down at some point, right? Like this is, uh, doesn't quite work visually, right? So I've cranked up the normal map to 10 here. And this is also a good explanation of what's happening. Inside the sphere, you can, it looks like it's, there's all this up and down jaggedness to it. But if you look at the edge of the actual shape, it's still perfectly spherical. It hasn't done anything to actually distort the shape. It's just distorting the way that light interacts with the surface of the object. And so this is one of the ways that you can make a lot of detail in a 3D environment without having to have a whole mess of polygons. You can encode a lot of the detail in the textures. And this is one of those ways, using the normal map. Let's put it back at uh, 2. Cool. And I'll re change the name of this material to uh, rock. And you know, it might make more sense, actually, to uh, put this material uh, on the ground. There we go. Right, so now you can see how this works. This is a material that comes from uh, Polyhaven. And so this is something that would be tileable as well. Um, so in a material over here, you have tiling. If I wanted, wanted there to, this rock to be more dense here, I could put it at uh, 2, 2. And I don't see any seams because this particular texture was made to be seamless, right? If I just took some random picture and tiled it like this, we would definitely see the edges of it. But here we could start to see the repeating pattern. If you tiled it a lot, the repeating pattern would pop out. If I did like 8, 8, like now, there's a lot of detail. And if I were playing the game like at this level, it would be fine. But if I were in a helicopter looking at the ground, be like, oh, okay, this is clearly like the same thing, just repeated over and over again. Right. So a lot of it depends on the scale of the game. Cool. Good question, Rocio. This folder open. Here's Amanda. Hi, this is Amanda Hughes, and this is my participation video for this week. A couple um, things that I uh, had issues with this week is I forgot that when you go and you move your ball after the animation, you want to move it using 
seeking the parent as opposed, as opposed to, the to the child. child. Um, I, I found, found during, during the troubleshooting trouble and the testing that, testing that the, the, it, was it was doing, doing the, the weird um, path because I had, had met the, the, or I had 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 met the child as a parent. parent. Uh, and then I actually, actually resubmitted my assignment. The, the our, our, my classmates class helped help me adjust my keyframes, making the bounce a little more realistic, as to, as opposed to the really slow bounce that I had originally made. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I edited. The, the original, original copy, copy of my bounce ball, which was this one. I went and I adjusted my keyframes similar, similarly to how you do it in system where you edit, um, holding down shift. But um, I went and I adjusted my keyframes. Yeah, I don't think you need to hold down shift. Once you select everything with the square, if you just grab this it'll smush them this way if you grab this it'll smush them in this direction it's on the original and then it went and adjusted it on the copies of the original objects that was really neat right so she said she adjusted the bounce on the animation clip and then all of the other objects changed why did all the other objects change because each individual asset that we make down here is a separate file, okay? And so that animation clip that we made for the bounce, it's a file here, it's a separate clip. Remember, it shows up as a separate thing. And that, um, all of the balls are reading that same file. So if you adjust the file, it all changes. So same instance here. The material is a separate file. Everything that's separate down here is a separate file. And the sphere and the plane are reading the same material. And so if I come in here and change this material, both of them change, right? Because they both are reading the same material. If I would want the sphere to be one rock color and the floor to be another, I would need to have two materials. So I would control drag this rock material and now I have rock and rock one and this one I could just make regular rock and this one is red rock and so now they could be separate it looks separate right because they have two they're reading two different materials I'm super excited to learn about the software, and I hope everybody has a great week. Cool. Thank you, Amanda. Abby? So, I was just wondering if it matters where we put the animation on, like, the object. Because I think throughout the stream, we were doing it on the child, so I actually put the actual object. But I started doing it on the parent. And it, it still, still ended, ended up, up working, working in the end, end for this, this one, one. So, so I'm just, I'm just curious, curious if it matters where the animation goes, goes or does or it does have, it have to, to be on like the object, object not the... the you, you want it to be on the child object. We do not want any animation on the parent object, right? This allows us to easily duplicate it uh, and move things around within the game, right? That way the animation is relative to this point in space. Right. This happens to be this idea, the, the quicker you kind of grasp this, the better. Like local space, the child, its coordinates are in local space, meaning that its distance, its x, y, and z are measured in distance from the parent. The parent, the things at the top of any particular hierarchy, are in world space. Their coordinates are measured in relationship to the world, right? The entire world. And the world, uh, has one origin, like usually in the very middle of the scene. 
if I make a new object, just an empty game object, and I reset it so it's at 0, 0, 0, and so this is the center of the world. Everything that's at the top level of a hierarchy is relative to this coordinate, the origin, right? Similar to math class, right? When you do the Cartesian plane in math class, this is the origin, right? And everything on the graph is relative to the origin. But child objects, it's as if the parent is their origin, and now their location is relative to that coordinate. Cool. So yes, you want to put the animation one level down. Hi, I think, I think the, the only, only question, question that, that I was really thinking of while we were creating um, these, these different, different textures, textures on the material is, is if there was, there was a way, way to create a unique, unique um, textures, textures, like, like maybe, maybe making the sphere rocky, rocky or, or, or adding the fur onto an object. So, Rock, yeah, we just did that. Um, you know, rewind the video 10 minutes. But you all have already seen this this one. Um, so fur is a little bit different. Um, fur is something that actually like, you know, sticks out from the surface. So that's a little bit of a different story. But things like uh, rock and paint and metallic detail, those kind of things are all going to be done similar to how the rock is done. Um, just, just to give it a unique, unique kind, kind of look. look. I, I know, know that, that we have, have like smoothness, smoothness and metallic, metallic but, but I was I wondering what the limitations, limitations are of, of adding, adding texture. texture. I think, I think that's, that's all I can think of. Right. Bye. Bye. Cool. Yeah, we, we talked about as much of that as I want to delve into right now. In about a week, maybe two weeks, we'll get into it in way deeper. But um, yeah, we just did the thing with the with the rock. And so when you're looking at materials online, right, the one place, if you wanted to practice with some of this or um, grab some materials to play around with, um, Polyhaven textures. These are all uh, provided by this gentleman for free online. And so, um, there's a lot to be said about applying these types of things, but if you just grab the um, color and the normal, you can get a, a lot of mileage out of that. That's where you can get most of your look. So let's say, oh, this is cool, this uh, forest ground. I can click on that. And over here, um, I can choose the size, and 2K is going to be fine for now. And under the textures here, the thing I would write down in my nose is diffuse equals color, right? It's the top channel, the one that has, you know, the color in it. Uh, and then the other one we'll grab right now is the normal, like I said. And so we'll grab the PNG for the diffuse, download that. We'll grab We'll grab the normal PNG, right click, and we could do the same thing. Materials are super fun. Once you, you know, this is going to get you a lot of mileage, right? So here they are, diffuse and uh, normal, drag them both in. And now, I can't just put them on there, I need to right click and create a material. We'll call it this forest, floor, and apply our stuff. So this goes here, and this goes here, and I'll say like, hey, do you want us to fix it? Yeah, fix it. And now, I should be able to put this uh, there.
since it's on the floor here, you can see I can increase the sort of level of indent here. And it even interacts with our lighting. Right? So no geometry here. It's just pixel information about being sort of in relief from the surface. Cool. Great question. Almost done. Nolan. All right, so the only question I had this week was, um, are there any keyboard shortcuts that will make uh, navigating and making projects more easy? Because I felt looking around, uh, it was kind of difficult. So if there was any uh, keyboard shortcuts that make that easier, if I had it. So, yeah. The ones that we talked about are Alt. I mean, this is how I'm navigating most of the time. The other one we talked about is centering on something, right? So if I want to look at this sphere here, uh, moving the mouse over here and press F, it'll center the view on the thing that I currently have selected, right? And so that is a good one, especially if you get super zoomed out for some reason, and you're like, where'd everything go? Or now I can select this and say F and it zooms in. So it makes it easier to look at the different things. Over here, this uh, is kind of our orientation of our camera. We can look at things directly from different sides by clicking here, here, and here. It kind of spins the view. So when you come to position things, this can be super useful. And then you can come back to using the Alt keys over there. So those are the two things I use most often, and then the F key if I get really discombobulated. Good question, Stephanie? Is there, there no, no save, save incremental, incremental for, for Thank, Thank you. you. No, there's no save incremental. We're going to look at some options here for how to keep things um, backed up. But again, it's not super simple because it's a whole file structure. Kai. Let me hear that one more time. Altering the screen color? I mean, you can do that in that menu. Um, right, because we did the play mode tint. But I think this is the regular color. No, that's just the background. Background, center. I, maybe you can't do that. I'd, I'd never do that. Unity used to be brighter, but now it's like a dark, um, you know, interface. Background for the center axis selected. Yep. Not that I know of. So. Um, I 
think we're stuck with the gray for now. It used to be way brighter, so it, that is nice. Amaya. <laughs> So just to note, what, whatever you're doing up until now, Amaya, you're doing something with the mic and it was really super tough to make it out. But now that you stopped touching the screen or whatever that was, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you pretty well. Not at a reasonable time, but hey, I completed it and got done. No ideas are that. Yeah, don't touch the computer. Yeah, don't touch the computer. Yeah, don't touch the computer. Yeah, don't touch the Yes. Okay. So you don't have to answer every question each week. You know, I put those there sort of like, you know, if you do come to the weekly submission, you're like, I don't know, like as some prompts to give people something to react to. It's not like a list where you got to answer all those things every, every week. And then, yeah, don't touch your computer while you're recording. The, the mic is definitely uh, touchy. Do you know? Yeah, so uh, anytime you're on Mac, uh, we're all on Windows here. I'll, I'm always on Windows. Uh, control equals Command, right? So for you, it'll be Command. Shift F. So command is the one with the um, four leaf clover looking thing on it. Uh, so anytime I say control, you should just hear command. My, uh, my Thank you. Yeah. And in fact, um, Yeah, right here. So in the game object menu, the shortcuts are right here, right? So this is the one we're using right here, align with view, control shift F. And on the Mac, it'll look, it'll, they'll be different so that it looks like uh, what it is on Mac, right? The, this thing, right? That's command for you, It'll be command shift F. Um, so you can find that there. And Angelina. I ordered a camera. Background music. Off of Amazon, so I hope to get that on Monday. Great. Of course, I don't have one on my PC setup. I don't just do it. But um, something that was pretty difficult, kind of unclear for me, was when we were creating a key for on the, on the timeline, timeline here, here for the, for the, for the sphere, sphere bounce, bounce and, and you would go, go up, up into, into the transform section. section. I like I watched it back a bunch of times. If you right click and, and it says add, add key, key and it, it doesn't, doesn't say add key for me. And, and I, I, I tried, tried it like, like 
a couple other times, times and there's a lot, a lot of different, different ways, ways and it just still wasn't being at ease. So, um, I got, I got it the first time it worked fine and then I had to like redo it for whatever reason. I, I somehow figured it out. I felt like it was a little weird. But now for some reason it just won't come up for me anymore. So I was just wondering. Um, is there, is there a, a trick, trick to how to add a key? I just would like that to be a little bit more clear. Um, so you have to have a, a an animation clip selected to add the key. Right, if I just click on this object to add a key, it's not going to give me that option because this object is not animated. Right, there's no animator on the object there's not reading any animation clip and so there's no uh, we don't get that right click uh, add key option once you're dealing with something that has a once you're dealing with something that has an animation clip on it and you're in here right when we're actually editing said animation we can now add a key right so in the other animation programs everything is like automatically animatable right in After Effects that's kind of the idea. You move all the stuff in Unity. You know, it's a game, and so they're trying to be a little more efficient. And so some things have um, won't have the ability to be animated until you specifically do that. <coughs> cool. Okay, good. We got through all that. Awesome. All right. Everyone seems to uh, understand how that works. Paul was there. Brandon's here. Yeah. So everybody else, you guys all just wrote in person, right? Yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you, everybody's great understanding how this works. Excellent. Okay. Let's get going. So for this week, we've got. Um, the reason I set this up like this was to make it clear that in Unity we have you know, 2D objects existing alongside of 3D objects, right? We've got this one, which is clearly not 3D rocks, right? It's just a plane. And usually when we're talking about something that's existing in the game like this, it's a, it's a sprite, right? But it's essentially just a plane with a picture on it that is able to um, be moved and positioned and everything just like um, just like any sort of object in 3D space. And so we can uh, combine all of these things together here. So what we want to get to this week is that we want to um, take some sort of existing piece of art that you've done uh, or you know, if you want to create something new, that's fine. And we're going to create some interaction and animation of that based on um, uh, using the tools that we have here. And so we used the animation tools to you know, clearly animate everything. We used the script to add interactivity and we have a new script here this week uh, mouse interaction on collider and so I'm gonna drag this one into the existing project and so this week 
we are not going to start, I'm not going to give you a whole other project to download, right? We're going to use this project. We'll make a new scene in this project, right? To where you'll build your thing. But here we're going to use the existing project because we already got a bunch of things set up, right? The recorder, a few other things. Um, and we can bring in more functionality by adding scripts to this project. Right, so this mouse interaction, I should be able to just drag this into here. When you do this, um, it brings it in and it says compiling. Uh, so it's compiling the code, the script here. It's kind of evaluating it and making sure it's going to run. And it brings it in, and how do we know we're okay? A couple of things. So it, it worked. We have a script, and let's see what happens if we could apply the script to an object, right? So let's say this bouncing ball here. Remember, I can apply the script either by dragging it from here onto here, or I could drag it from here over to here, or I could select this and start typing the name of the script and double click and it applies it. Um, and it does apply it here and I get some fields. Each of these fields, if you haven't marked this down already, this type of interface here, this is what we'll refer to as an unity event. Okay, So it's an event that we can uh, send a signal out to do other things. Right, so we can send an event when something is clicked. We can send an event when you mouse over something. The instant, the one frame, it goes on to that object. Um, when it's over that object or when it leaves that object. Right, we can have discrete things happening at each of those times. Now, a word about importing scripts. So they come up here with this pound sign. What code language is Unity written in? C sharp, right? And you know, music people, that's a sharp, right? There's flats and sharps and that's a sharp. Um, the uh, this went well. How do I know it went well? Because I imported it. It showed up here as a script and I was able to apply it. That's best case scenario. Let's look at what happens when things go wrong. So for instance, I will do the thing that happens most often when people are trying to apply scripts. And I will download the script again. I'm going to remove it so you can get rid of a component here by just right clicking and say remove. And I'll uh, del I'll remove it from here because I'm going to start over to sh showcase or um, demonstrate how to fix this when it goes wrong. So I'm going to get rid of the script. Remember, when you delete from here, it's gone, right? Because this down here, this is essentially just the file browser. It's as if you opened up the file browser and just deleted the file off of your computer. Um, I'm going to do that right now so that I can redo it. So go ahead and delete this. OK. Unity will take a second to like recompile the scripts. And here's the one I just downloaded. And I'll drag it in to the project. <coughs> and
I get this. Can't add script component because the script class cannot be found. Make sure that there are no compile errors in the file name class and name match. In this case, when I apply it, I'm getting this error. We're not going to write a whole bunch of code, but we need to interact with code. Okay, so an error just means that the computer doesn't understand the code some, in some fashion, right? When it doesn't understand the code, fortunately, um, it tells you about it like that. The other place that it's going to tell you about it is in the console, right? So the console is a window that we haven't looked at. It's the way the computer gives you feedback. It's the way that Unity gives you feedback. And right now we don't have an error there, but we do have the error when we tried to drag this over there. It wouldn't let us apply this script. The reason why is this. This happens most often when people are doing this, right? So here's when I downloaded it the first time at the beginning of class. And here's where I downloaded it, you know, just about uh, eight minutes ago, right? And so what's different about these two files? Yeah, the name, right? Um, because when I downloaded it the second time, it goes into the same folder, right? And you cannot have two files with the same name in the same folder, right? The computer would be confused, right? If you have two things named dog.jpg in the same folder, it wouldn't know which one to access when you asked for dog.jpg, right? Now you can have the same file name in different folders, but not in the same folder. And so Windows tries to save you from yourself here, right? In that when you do try to dump another file with the same name into the same folder, it puts, right, so appends means it adds it to the end, that one, which is usually not a problem, right? For doing images or movies, the image, um, Photoshop doesn't care if it has an extra one at the end of it, nor does the uh, movie player app. It's fine. But in this case, since we're dealing with um, a piece of code and the way that C Sharp is set up, the name that's inside the code, the name of the class, needs to match the file name. Okay, now we don't need to go into a whole bunch of detail about what a class is. It's a type of code, like a category of code. Um, and so, but it needs to match the file name. And so what does this mean? We cannot change the file name. Okay, so um, there are some options here. One is if you have this one there, or it could be another number. If you had downloaded it like five times, it would be in your, it would be four or five that's in there, is to remove the one. Okay, now you need to make sure you remove the parentheses, the one, the other parentheses, and the space. But you can do that if you just click on it here and click over here and then backspace, 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 backspace. Now, I've removed that other junk that Windows put on there, and <coughs> we'll give it a second to recompile, think for a second. Hold on, okay. Now, boom, works, right? I'm able to apply that script, right? Now, if you look, just to be clear, if you look at the downloads folder, this one still has a one because this is not the file that is in Unity, right? This isn't like After Effects where Unity is referencing this file. When we drag something into this folder here, it is copying the file. Where is it copying it to? The assets folder. 
which is the only folder that you really care about in the project, right? You have your project folder, and then inside the projects folder, you've got a couple things. Assets, library, logs, blah, 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 blah. Like I said, this one is the one that all of our work is stored in there. And so when we drug that script into here, it automatically copied it into here. And so now, if we look at it in the file finder here, you'll see that it has the correct name. Another word here, you know, this stuff is pretty dry, but you got to really, there's a few problems here because if we end up with a error of some kind, then we can't um, move forward. I'll show you that here in a second. But another thing to notice that when you're looking at the files, over here we just see the regular files, right? There's two scripts, there's a sprite, there's some other stuff. If we look over here, we see that that stuff is there, but then there's always this other folder, this other file that's just uh, metadata. And so that is Unity creating data about that file, in which case you can just leave these alone. They're fine, right? When you interact with the files that are in your project, even though, like I said, they're just files in the folder, you should do it here. That lets Unity handle the metadata and all that kind of business, right? But you should be aware that it's there. When you open it up, you can see that they're, uh, yeah, everything has a separate meta file where it's storing just a tiny bit of information about it, but they're all very small. Cool. Okay. Let's Let's bring in some other things here. So in order to bring in some other piece of art that you've made previously, we're going to need to divide it into other parts. We want to create something that allows the user to mouse over or click on different things in order to create some sort of interactivity. Um, and we're going to need to separate out different sources. Right now we have this one source, this rock. For this week, most of what we're going to bring in are going to be 2D elements, but there'll be 2D elements that we could arrange in 3D space here, right? The word for that or term for that is usually 2.5D, where it's flat. It's like a world, a 3D world that's filled with cardboard cutouts. You can move them forward and backwards, but they're all thin. They don't have any depth to them. And so for instance here, let's turn off these spheres for the time being. And so, for instance, I could create more of like a um, group of rocks here. Let's go ahead and rotate this back so it's kind of flat. 
and I could control D this rock bring it back here bring one over maybe hit R scale this up create another layer of rocks behind it here and maybe to give it more variety this one I'll rotate when you rotate think about when we rotate things in 3D think about the axis being the pin around which the object will rotate right and so we need to rotate around the green one here what dimension is the green one David you got a 30 percent chance We're rotating, kind of, it's the Y, right? Everybody memorize this from last time, right? Red, let's all maybe write it down or commit it to memory again. Red, X, right? Blue is Z, and green, Y. You gotta memorize that, right? It's the same in every program. Blender, Cinema 4D, 3S Max, Unity, Unreal, all of them, same. So memorize that one. But here we're going to rotate around the Y. So I could do something like this and create a more interesting group of rocks. I could move forward or backwards. And the plane here, I want to create more ground. And so I need to scale this up. Let's say maybe 10, 10, 10. And that gives me some more room for the start of this scene. Main camera, control shift F. There we go. And so just with this one sprite, I could do this type of thing to create a much more complex you know, area in my scene here, right? I can duplicate this again, move one over here again. to create a whole thing there. As we're doing this, you may have noticed that as I just sort of do this to like look at the scene, look at the view, um, we see that uh, we're kind of cropping the game view here, right? And so let's look at the game view settings up here. So in many instances, by default, this is set to free aspect. And in general, that's not great. We want a fixed aspect ratio so that the camera that we're looking at at the game is not changing between like a phone and like a flat screen television. We're going to make our stuff for TV. And so TV is at what aspect ratio? Does anybody know? 16 by 9, right? 16 across, 9 up and down. And so here, in this aspect ratio, we conveniently already have that as one of the options. And so let's go ahead and select that. And so now, as I do this, it scales it so that, you know, I can see it on the screen, but it's not distorting the aspect ratio. So now we have a consistent way that our camera is looking at the game, right? In that this is gonna stay in that 16 by nine aspect ratio in the game view up here. Now, some students um, play with this. We're gonna wanna leave this scale for the view at one so that we can see what we're doing. You can zoom up here but all you're doing is like you're literally just making the pixels bigger. And so by zooming up here, you're not getting closer in the game. 
If I wanted to do that, I would need to change the position of the main camera. All this is doing is taking the existing pixels and just blowing them up on the screen, right? Which is why it looks crummy if you, um, you know, scale it the whole way up to, you know, whatever it is here. So you want to keep this at one, keep this at 16 by nine, so that as you make adjustments here, you can um, make clear judgments about what is actually going to be on screen and what's not. Because before we did this, if it was a free aspect ratio, right, it would be hard to tell like what's going to end up on screen or not. If I put something over here, we wouldn't see it now, but we would see it if I did that. Right? It's just not the best way to work. So we want to leave it in the 16 by 9 aspect ratio so we can see what's going on. If I wanted to zoom in on this, it would be a matter of moving the main camera, right? so the camera closer to the view. See how that's different than what I did when I used the scale up here? It's not making the pixels bigger. It's actually moving the camera closer. Everything is still very crisp, but now I can you know, move closer or move farther away from this view. So we want to keep that in 16 by 9. Let's add this ball here. All of the sprites that I've added here these, let's bring in some more sprites. Our sprites, we want them to be in PNG format. Why do we want them to be in PNG format? Because we are making a 2.5D composition here, and we need them to have the regular color channels. And so color is stored in three numbers, R, G, B, for red, green, and blue, right? And then in order to actually have this cut out, we need to have A. A stands for the alpha channel. The alpha channel is the thing that allows us to have this be transparent around the ball here. Um, without that, it would not be transparent. So for instance, these are some from the end of last semester. And this window is, here we go, much better. OK, so I'll do this in Illustrator. However, any image program you're going to use can export a PNG file, OK? So um, obviously, the Adobe program support it. Illustrator, Photoshop, What other programs does, do people like to use to draw things in 2D on the computer? Anything. Procreate, right? You got an iPad, right? Procreate exports a PNG file. A lot of students like Clip Studio Paint. Anybody want to use that one? Yep. Krita another open source Photoshop kind of app. But literally, anything is going to export a PNG file. And so you need to export PNG with alpha. So here, for instance, this leaf, if we were going to bring this in, 
I wouldn't save the Illustrator file. I'm going to export. Export as, and down here. Right? And we have these options, not JPEG. Why not JPEG? Because a JPEG does not have an alpha channel. The JPEG is a different format. The JPEG is designed for the web. It's compressed, it's fast, it's not designed to be a working file format. It's designed to be a web publishing file format. And we are not publishing this on the web. We're you know, using it in another program and it needs to have an alpha channel. And so we do not want JPEG, we want PNG. And so in this case, in Illustrator, PNG file. And let's export this to one more thing here. When we have this option, this may or may not be an option when you're exporting, we always want 72 DPI or PPI. What does this stand for? Anybody know? Dots per inch or pixels per inch. Uh, any screen is going to be at 72. And especially the Adobe programs, you have to be careful with this because if you start Illustrator in a different matter, it may be set to 300 PPI, right? Because that's what you would be using if you were to print stuff. I don't care about printing things at all. We don't print anything in this class. I'm pretty sure I won't hand you any paper over the entire course of the semester. We care about screens. And screens, we always want to be at 72 dots per inch. And obviously, one of the reasons we're doing this is because we want the background to be transparent, right? Anytime you see the checkerboards like this, this is usually how it's done in a program, and certainly how it's done in all the Adobe programs. Like Procreate, it's done like this, right? The transparent background is checkerboard. Almost, this is one of those things that everyone has agreed on, once again. Like this checkerboard is transparency. Um, means that you're going to get that RGB plus A channel. And so now we'll say, OK. And I've already forgotten where I put it. Let's do it one more time. Make a new folder up here at the very top. Leaf. PNG. Okay. Great. And in my file browser, it should look like this. You can check and make sure it's a PNG file right there. And so I can drag that into Unity. Great. Now, let's finish this import process in that talk about there are many different image categories. In Unity. We've already come across three of them, right? We had a texture. We had a normal map, and the one we're gonna we want to do right now. I have a 2D thing with an alpha channel. This is gonna be a sprite. Okay, so all of these things would be PNG files when you look at them on your file browser, but you need to tell Unity what you're gonna do with this PNG file. Am I going to use it as a sprite, like a picture? It's come just on a plane. Am I gonna wrap it around? a piece of geometry, like a texture. It, you know, I would select texture, or I would select normal, if this is actually a normal map. We'll get into how to make normal maps later. But um, yeah, all three of those would be PNG files. But here, you have to tell Unity what you're going to do with it. How do you tell Unity what you're going to do with it? You select the asset, right? Anytime I say the word asset, we're down here, the actual file. Anytime I say the word game object, we're up here. These are things that function in the game. And so I'm going to select the leaf, 
And up here, under texture type, we need to switch it to sprite. Right? In that, that's what we're going to do with this leaf. We want it to be just a sprite that we can use. And so I'll switch it to sprite. And since it's a file, there's this one extra step. It'll apply it here. Although if I were to click off of it, I think it says, yeah, it prompts you. It says like, hey, you changed this. Do you want me to officially do that and apply it? And you can say, yeah. So it does that. And so now, if I were to drag this up here into space, it gives it to me. And if I let go, watch what happens. It makes a whole new object. It automatically puts a sprite renderer on that object that has the leaf loaded on it. So super convenient in that we're able to just drag that into the empty space. Now let's make sure, let's do that one more time. If I were to do this, yeah, I think you kind of have to get to the background here, but then it comes back. So the same thing here, if I were to grab, you see the ball sprite, it has a arrow right there, so it's unfolded. It can drag these up here to sort of duplicate them in the scene. Makes it easy to bring in new objects like this. Right, and we can adjust the scale here. And you can see that as I move it forward and back, you know, it gets covered up depending on how far along in the Z it is there, right? It works this way because I've oriented my camera over here along the Z axis, right? If my camera were discombobulated along another side, it would depend where it is. But in this case, it makes the most sense to make sure the camera itself is not rotated much on the X so that it's pointing forward in this direction it makes it easy to make things move in the Y along the Z there to sort of make this work. Cool. All right, so let's make this uh, 2D ball bounce here. This will be something that we can include in our image if we want. And we'll add some more animation technique to what we're doing. Cool. So I've got this ball here and we're going to want to do something similar. We're going to have this bounce but we're going to, when we click on it, we want to add a couple more wrinkles today. One is that now we can control things when um, things are clicked, right? That we did that on Wednesday. But that mouse interaction script has four different slots for possible events. And so we can also do something and change it on mouse enter. This is one of the ways that we can, A, fulfill what we're doing here. We're animating something that's interactive. But you're going to be creating something here and handing it off, making a version that people can interact with. How do people, how does this happen in games? How do you know everybody has experienced this sort of intrinsically, right? Especially in newer games, it's large, complicated environments. There's very few where everything you see can be interacted with, right? There's certain objects that you interact with and other ones that are just there for the world building, for the environment, for the atmosphere. How do games tell you what you can do something with and what you can't? Sure. 
Sure, an, an icon appearing, so like an image appearing to let you know that this is a thing I can do something with, or straight up text, this is a thing I can do something with. What what kind of other things is, uh, do people use? What could you change about an object to communicate that it's interactable? If you didn't want to throw up a message or a picture. That might be something, right? If the mouse, if you moused over it, it jiggled or something like that, right? There's definitely games that do that, right? To let you know that this is a thing and that's not. So it could have some animation that, that so it could move to signal that it's uh, interactable. It could change color, right? This is one I was thinking of. It highlights, right? That happens a lot, right? If you go into a different view, what was I playing with? This has happened. Oh, the Guardians of the Galaxy game. You go into like a whole separate view, and then everything is highlighted according to what's interactable and what's not. But, you know, highlights. Um, so that this is a, you know, when an object glows when you mouse over it, something like that, lets you know that this is a thing that can be changed. So let's try and do that one right now. We'll have this one change. Um, where are we at? Six o'clock. Okay. Let's take the next 20 minutes to do some deep dive on the animation. So um, we want to, we'll get to adding some highlights to this to let the user know that this is interactable. But we want to essentially create the same thing. We want this to bounce, but we're going to add squash and stretch, one of our fundamental principles of animation on this ball. Uh, in order to do that, we want it to sort of smoosh down, launch itself into the air, and then stretch back down towards the ground. Um, anytime we get into any sort of meaningful animation, uh, we need to be able to control all the keyframing, and we also need to be able to control the anchor points. That's a key part of all of this, right? Because right now, the problem with this sprite is that uh, which of these parameters up here would we animate to squash and stretch this thing? Scale, scale right? And so if I start messing around with the scale here, OK, that's not bad. I start doing this. Hmm. It does do what I want here as far as squashing or stretching to some extent, but um, it's doing it into the center of the ball, which in instance when we have something hitting the ground, it's going to be much easier if it's squashing down into that position. And so what we do we need to do here is we need to change the anchor point on this thing. And we do this in the sprite. Ground. Okay, just check. Um, let's do it. So in the sprites, this the anchor point is a function of the asset here, and we edit it in the sprite editor. So this telling it that this picture is a sprite is important the next important thing is that we go to the sprite editor and if I press that it says no sprite oh we need the extra package so we'll just say okay and is it going to prompt us no okay well good Downloading packages. <laughs> this used to be built in, but now it's not. So we've already done, you haven't done it, but I've done it when I prepared this for you. What are packages? Extra Unity features. Okay. 
And so the one that's already in the project is the recorder. Okay, the thing you use to make the movie file, that's a separate package. And so Unity works on this paradigm in that there's the core program, but people use Unity for a lot of different stuff. 2D games, 3D games, virtual reality, augmented reality, applications, architecture, all sorts of things, right? People want way different things out of the program, but it's used for all those things because the core of it is useful. And so everybody downloads the core and then extends the functionality in the direction that they want to go with these packages. Okay? And so we need to extend it in the 2D animation direction. So we need the sprite package. Up here, where is all this stuff? In the conveniently named package manager. So window, package manager. And up here, this is important. Where do we want to look? Where can we look? Our options are Unity Registry. These are the official Unity packages, right? So the ones released by the company, theoretically, they should all work pretty flawlessly with the install that you have, theoretically. Um, and then there's in project. These are the packages you already have installed. And then my assets. Those would be packages that you would get for free or buy on the asset store. And they are not from Unity. They are other people, right? And so the asset store, we'll talk about it more later. There's some great stuff in there. There's some not so great stuff in there. It, you know, it depends. It's just, it's a marketplace. You know, sometimes you get what you pay for, other times you don't. Um, and in our case, for most of the stuff here at the beginning, we'll just be dealing with Unity packages that are coming from the official source. And this is the case with this one. And so, for instance, I'll go to Unity Registry, and I'll come over here and I'll search for Sprite. Cool, and there it is. 2D Sprite, not 2D Sprite Shape, 2D Sprite. And then I'll say, yeah, I need to install that package. And click the button. And wait a minute while it brings it down, installs it. Wait a minute. We didn't need to use this in previous semesters because the 2D sprite package used to be part of the core, but then they decided that um, that this 2D work should be a separate package, so so be it. And so now if we go to in project, these are all the ones that we currently have installed. And so there it is, it's 2D sprite. And then right here, recorder. That's the one that we use to uh, record your homework, right? And then there's some other ones here that are just automatically installed um, when you're uh, just with any project. So cool, we've extended it. Let's see if it worked. And so now if I click on Sprite Editor, ah, I get the Sprite Editor. Excellent. So here's the Sprite Editor, and this is the anchor point right there, this circle, kind of like how they display it in After Effects. And um, I need to move this to where I want the anchor point for this object to be. And so I'll move it down here. So it's at the bottom. And I'll close that window. And again, it says like, hold on, do you want to apply these changes? And yes, I do. Now, when I click on here, excellent. The tool here is now at the bottom where the anchor point is. And now if I scale this, it squishes down to the floor and up away from it, which is much more advantageous for objects that sit on the ground. 99% of the time, if you have an object, you know, it's not like a balloon or floating thing, right? spaceship, airplane, things that sit on the ground, 
most of the time you want the anchor point for said object or said sprite to be at the bottom so that when you zero it out it sits on the floor provided the floor is at zero it's the best practice when it goes to this cool great all right we've prepared this and let's animate it so we're going to create parent then we are going to add animator to child right with our animator button then we'll create two animation clips one is going to be bounce and the second one is going to be just kind of blank stop actually then we'll take create a third one because we're going to need to have one for change color our highlight that's going to show us what's happening when we mouse over because we want the bounce to happen when we click it and we want the color change to happen when we mouse over right and so those need to be two separate um, states let's do the bounce first because we need to get in some animation nitty-gritty there so first thing we'll create parent so create empty parent I want to make sure that the parent and child are at the same location and how can I tell I can select them both and the axis doesn't move right so if you use that create parent option it creates the parent at the same location as the child which is what we want and so this will be 2d ball parent turn off my caps lock there we go and just like before we're going to create the animation not here. We're going to create the animation there. Animation. This is selected. Create. It'll ask us, what do you want to call this? 2D ball bounce. Cool. Let's do some bouncing we will first do the up and down and then do the squash and stretch so i'm going to turn on my record button and add a position key go to about halfway move this up and just like before we want it to end up at the same place it starts right so the copy the keyframes from beginning to the end that always gives us a seamless loop control C control V okay it's looping it's not bouncing but it's looping right so halfway less than halfway we've got this we got to come in here and do the same thing to the curves come in here select Y right Y is the only one that we really care about right now press F to frame it up and here and here I want to be able to grab these handles and move them you'll notice that um, the default here in unity for handling Bezier handles is that I can grab you know just grab the keyframe and grab the handle but I can't pull the handle you notice that the handle stays here the same length unity has different types of handles if you right click here under tangent right so the bezier handle is the tangent here and so this would be the right tangent and if you look at the options um, we have the default here which is constant 
And if we want to be able to control the curve more, we switch it to weighted. And so here, right click, right tangent, weighted. Now we get a handle and I can drag the handle in order to have way more control over the curve, curvature, right? Same thing here. Right click. In this case, it would be the left tangent weighted. Cool. All right, we've got one bounce. Let's get some of that squashing and stretching going on now. Now, uh, like I said, we just want it to bounce once when we click on it, kind of like before. Uh, let's have it come down here and squash when it hits the ground. So this ball, when we click on it, it's not going to be like a normal ball. We're adding squash and stretch, and we're giving it more of a sense of, of life, right? We're tapping into the principles of animation, the Disney list of the illusion of life, giving it something that, you know, agency as a result of this. And so, for instance, here, it sort of throws itself into the air, and so we'll have it stretch up into the air. We need to set positions and keyframes on scale. And so coming back to the beginning here, I'm going to set a key on the scale at 111. And as it's going into the air, I'm going to stretch that way. But in order to conserve the volume somewhat, anytime you increase this, you want to decrease here and here, right? Think about this. We'll do this again with the 3D sphere, right? Um, the Z is not really going to do much in this instance. But uh, when we stretch out this way, we want it to lengthen and contract in this direction. And so let's, do, let's keep the math easy. And so I'll stretch to 1.4, and then I'll subtract 4 over here. So that's going to give me 0 0.6 and 0.6. happening really quick. If we come back to the dope sheet view here, let's grab these and move them over a little bit. So we stretched out and once we get up here, by the time we get to this part of the bounce, we want to stop stretching. We'll return to normal as we float in the air. And so we'll come back to one, 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 and again add a key. Cool. And now, as we're heading towards the ground, we want to squash when we hit the ground. We hit the ground here. What's the problem? We don't have any more room, right? We're out of room here. We hit the ground here. We don't want to move these keyframes to the left because that's going to make our bounce uneven, right? We will take longer getting into the air than getting back down. In this instance, that's undesirable. We just need some more time when we're on the ground here at the bottom to squash. And so we need to take these keyframes and duplicate them over there so that we can create some time where we're just sitting on the ground. And so I'll grab this, Control C, and then sort of mouse over a little bit, Control V. And so now I can create some extra time when we hit the ground there. Let's look at what's going on, because we did go through the ground. And so let's look at our curves. Cool. And so this happened because we added these extra keyframes and now we have this handle here. And we don't want to go through the ground. We just want to sit on the ground here. And so this uh, right tangent here needs to be 
linear, so it just goes and stays on the ground. This tangent, the left tangent, should be linear. And so now we should just stay on the ground. Cool. Now, during this time, when we're on the ground, is when we can, we stretched over there, we can squash here. We have a period of time now in which to squash. And so here, we will commence squashing with the scale. Opposite of what we did before. We'll again, keyframe, add key at 111 move to about halfway through our squash, and we'll bring this down to 0.6, and we'll bring this out to 1.4. And the Z is not making a difference here visually, but for the sake of consistency, I'll do it, add key. And let's look at what this looks like here. F. So here's the beginning of a squash, squash, and right here, this is, again, we squashed when we hit the ground. But we want to return to the regular size. And so this scale 111 is normal size, undistorted. We need to return to that here. So you could grab this one, control C, come over here, control V. So now we squash and return. Let's look at all the keyframes together. Cool. Um, what is it? Shift. Yes. OK. Another great shortcut. Shift spacebar. This will make, um, it'll go full screen on the panel the mouse is over. This is great for laptops if you don't have two screens you're working on um, so that you can get a little bit more visual real estate in order to work, right? So I move my mouse over the animation timeline, shift spacebar, ah, full screen on just the timeline there so I can really see what I'm doing. And we can look at the anatomy of squash and stretch, right? So here, this is the Y coordinate of the ball going up and going down. The key part here is that it is curved. When you have curved keyframes for position, what does that tell you? When there's a curved line in your position graph. What is happening? Well, just the fact that it has vertical displacement means that it goes up and down. It could be going up and down at a constant speed. What does the curve tell us? Does it stay up in the air? No, it's still bouncing, right? Like it bounces up and down. It's not permanently up in the air. The curve. It shows maybe like the gravity? Yes. And what is gravity? Acceleration. Yeah. Change in speed. A curve, a curved line is a rate change. And since it's on a position, it is a change in speed. 
Now, in this case, we are changing the speed to mimic gravity, because this is what gravity does, right? It accelerates things towards the Earth at 9.8 meters per second. If you throw it up in the air, it's decelerating the object at 9.8 meters per second, right? Subtract it until, you know, for one moment, it's at zero when it's there, and it immediately starts reversing course, right? And so that's what this um, w this big curve is. This is the ball going up in the air. The steepness of this is the speed. And so it's starting off very quickly. It's starting off moving quickly. And then it. this is where it's got the least amount of slope, right? Where it's slowing down. And at this instant, its velocity is zero. And then it gets accelerated down towards the ground, increasing in speed until it hits the ground. This right here, this is the stretch up in the air. We are moving the y scale up so that it's stretching out. And the x and the z, we only see the blue line here because the x and the z are, they have the same keyframes. So like one is covering the other one up. The, the line is blue instead of red. But the red and the blue lines are the same. And so this is going down, hence the stretching into the air. If you look, this is the opposite. Now the blue line is on top because we're getting fatter. When we hit the ground, right? Because the sides are going out, the x and the z, and the top is going down, the y. And so we have smooshed. This is the squash. Is it making sense when you see it all laid out there at the same time? Now, the relationship of the timing of one to the other is important. We wouldn't want this to start happening over here, because that would mean the ball started deforming before it hit the ground, right? That doesn't, we're not trying to exactly mimic real life here, right? Um, that's not the point, right? The squash and stretch is the beginning of our entrance into stylized motion, right? The way things move in cartoons is exaggerated. I'm not saying things always need to move in that style, but is it a style of movement that you need to have a handle on as far as exaggerated physics there, right? This is sort of like level one squash and stretch. We could get way more cartoony. One of the ways we could get way more cartoony is to just exaggerate the amount of distortion squash bigger, squat stretch longer. Um, your shift space bar goes back out. Right, and so you could do that kind of thing by grabbing, whoops, don't grab them all at the same time, just click out of it. There we go. If I just grab this one, for instance, and if I were to move this one up a bunch and this one down, a bunch. Now, getting way more exaggerated, right? Looney Tunes, right? We're just crazy distortion. Um, and so this is one way that you can stylize the animation, right? Most of the students come into the class here with an understanding of the word style as it pertains to the lines on the page, right? Are the, is the line weight thick? Is it pastel colors? Is it bold colors? Uh, is there a lot of texture or grunge or not or whatever that denotes a specific visual style? Movement 
can also be stylized, right? We did a we did a bouncing ball on Wednesday, but that one wasn't stylized. It was just sort of like very plain, as if you just took a circle and drew a piece of circle on a white piece of paper and yeah, that's a ball, but it's a very unstylized ball, right? And so here, now we're moving it and we're starting to give it some more style. And so one possible option for the stylization is, you know, how much do we squash? How much do we stretch in this instance? And so let's go back to where we were. And another point of possible exaggeration is here at the moment we're at the top of the bounce, right? What happens to the coyote when he runs off of the mesa? You guys seen Looney Tunes? Like, I'm not sure. Like, they've rebooted it several times at this point, but like, yeah, yeah. Well, the Roadrunner is, you know, uh, against the coyote, right? He's trying to get the, the coyote runs off the, the mesa and he just hangs there, right? Until he realizes like, oh, there's no, and then he falls, right? And so um, hanging in the air is a function of how flat does this line get here? And so if we grab this one and set both tangents to weighted, if we were to drag these out, we could start to get something that again looked stylized in a different way. Now we hang way longer at the top. You could really drag these out. Right, now it's just hanging up there for a while. You could further add stylization in that now it could be uh, something we like to do sometimes is give it again that sense of agency that feeling of life is that the ball anthropomorphize the ball right the ball itself realizes it's hanging up in the air and propels itself towards the ground with a stretch a pre-stretch here so you could select another right about here let's add another key to the scale and have the ball stretch towards the ground And then, you know, return to normal size. Right about there. Let's see how that looks. Might have to move that one a little bit. Let's make it a little bit longer. If you hold down Shift when you drag these, they'll stay vertically aligned. Otherwise, you can displace them. You want to keep them there. Even more stylized now, right? Now we're propelling ourselves toward the ground. All of the things I've just shown you, they were all squash and stretch. But there's degrees, right? There's a continuum here. At one end, we have real physics and at the other end we have cartoon physics a continuum means that you can increase or decrease along this scale right it's not like there's only this and there's only this there's kind of a continuum a smooth change from one to the other right which is what we did wednesday we were definitely over here. When I finished this one about 15 minutes ago, we might have been like right about here. Now, we're starting to get to this territory over here, right? Because we've added several things that really exaggerate the physics to bring us more into that super cartoon, super distortion, the anthropomorphization, I'll get it, I'll get it, anthropomorphization sorry, of inanimate objects, right? Like this ball, where we give it human qualities like propelling itself towards the ground and exaggerated squash and stretch.
in order to do that. Cool. All right, so a deep dive there on the animation. Here's all my keyframes as they look on the dope sheet. Right, so this is all the position. This is all of the scale. So this is the only things I animated here, just the position and just the scale on these two things. Cool. All right, we've got one here. Uh, if you remember from last time, we need to get our inventory in there. We need three animation clips. Bounce, check. We need stop. That one's pretty easy. It's just a new animation clip that's blank, right? Uh, and then we need um, change color. We'll call it highlight. Let's make those. Uh, so again, anytime after you make the first one, then you can just come over here and say um, create new clip. Now we'll call this. I usually use the name of the thing, 2D ball, and then whatever it is, stop, right? Because uh, you're going to have animation clips on all many of the elements in the game. And so if you just label it stop or twist or whatever, then it just gets really confusing. Like, well, which one is this? Is this the one for the character or for the enemy or for whatever? Um, and so we'll call it 2D ball stop. And that will just be blank. And we'll add another one here for create new clip to I'll call this one highlight, or call it small my own device, 2D ball highlight. And we need to change the color here. So again, turn that on. Ooh, excuse me, come over here and boom, color. So we can uh, give this some sort of change in color here that would delineate that. Given the, what we have right now, we can't really make it brighter. We'll give it a different Um, well, the, by default, we're all the way here, so there's no more room up in this. Um, when we expand this idea, there's uh, some ways to give it extra brightness or whatever, but we're not going to, you have to do some other things. So we'll just give it like a slightly different hue or something right now, something like that. Let's see, what that looks good. Like that. Um, and turn that off. If we come back here, ball returns. There we go. Cool. We've got all three of those things. And awesome. Let's, uh, so we've got our three animation states, animation clips. They'll turn into states in the animator, which is where we can control the different, you know, how things get selected. Uh, and so let's do that. Up here, this should still be open from before. If not, window, animation, animator. And they should all be there if you have this object selected. So there we go, there we go, there we go. And uh, we've got bounce, stop, highlight. Um, which one do we want it to go to by default? Like when the game starts, what, which one of these do we want to have happen? Which one? Stop. stop. Yeah, because we don't want it to. We want to. We want to trigger the bounce when we click, and so stop should be the initial one. So again, you got to right click and say set as default. And so now that should be there. Cool. I'm going to set these up like this. And 
Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. The bounce. Let's leave it like that. So let's get the bounce hooked up. We've got, uh, we need to essentially connect these things to our states. And so we need our, not this script, this one I'll post on the new assignment, mouse interaction on Collider. So we'll be able to bring this over. One difference here is this, Collider. So the collider in Unity is how it knows if something is touching. Is something making contact with something else. We didn't have to deal with this on Wednesday by design because when you make a new sphere object, it automatically puts the sphere collider on there for you. However, when you make a new sprite object, it does not, right? We've got the renderer, we've got the animator, we've got the script that we just added, no collider. We need a collider for any of this stuff here to work. That's how it knows if the mouse has done these things. And so in this case, I'm going to add a box collider. We're going to add this one. It is a 2D image, but for right now, we're going to go with this one. In the scene view, you should be able to see it, right? So I'll remove this. It's a green box. So box collider, boom. You see it happen right there around the object. And in this case, the collide, well, let's leave it as is and then we'll test a few things. Let's test one thing, just the click. So let's get the click going. I want to, first of all, let's save and check. So we're gonna check and make sure that when we start the game, it does nothing. Okay. Um, this stuff is complex. There's no two ways about it, right? Uh, I think Unity does as good a job as it can of trying to lay it out in a simple way. It definitely seems more complex right now. As you do it more and more over the course of the semester, you'll get more ingrained. However, um, I would encourage you to get in the habit of not doing what they call the Big Bang. Don't do this. What is the Big Bang? The Big Bang is like, I'm going to work, 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 and then press play and see what happens. What you should do is one step and then check. Next step, check. Every time we check, we send it into play mode to make sure it's doing what we think it should be doing. Why do it this way? so that you know, you know where things went wrong. If you do the Big Bang, where you step, 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 and then go hit play, and it doesn't work, the options for why it doesn't work are much bigger than one, the next, and the next, if you check every time along the way. So, especially at the be beginning, avoid the Big Bang workflow. So what did we do so far? We know that the animations are what we want, that we did those and they look correct. We know that we set this up. Let's check this. Does the ball stop at the beginning? So we'll turn on the play. It does nothing. 
success, right? That's what we want right now. Cool, let's take the next step. Um, that when we click it, we wanna play the 2D ball bounce animation. And so on clicked, we need to send an event on clicked. So add plus, the question, first question, every time you do an event is what? What do you want me, sort of like what, or you can think of it as where? To which object do you want me to send this event to? Right? That's what this is asking. Because an event can go to the object that we have the script on, or it can go to some other object. Um, and so we want to, in this case, we're just sending it to the object that we're on. Ball spray. Good. And then, so in a Unity event, the first thing is what? And then, what is the thing you actually want to do? You know, what is the verb in this sentence? So kind of like subject verb. The verb is over here, and we need to select the animator, play, and then string, this one here, just like we did on Wednesday. And then in here, what do we play? And so like I said before, the best case scenario is to copy and paste the name of the animation clip, because if it's not perfectly correct, it won't play it. Okay, so that's on clicked. And let's save and check. Not Big Bang. Excellent. We clicked and it played. What's the problem here? Looping. Looping is set per animation clip. So it's annoying. I really wish that you could just click on the object here and say, don't loop. But you can't do that. Um, not because it's like technically impossible, but because it doesn't line up with how the system is set up. Anyway, you have to come down here to bounce. And here, we have the loop time. Turn that off. So now, again, I made a change. I'm going to check and make sure it does what I think it should do. Do Now, it played once, and then we were stuck here. And so it needs to play once here, and then go back to the stop. So I am going to right click and make transition to the ball stop. Let's make sure that that works. Great. Uh, cool. And so now we need to get the highlight in there. And so now when we want to send an event on mouse enter, which means that we have moused, the mouse has entered what zone, what is it, what zone, the zone is defined by the collider here, right? So it's not the shape of the sprite itself. It's the shape of the collider. The colliders are used to determine the interactivity for all of the objects. So we need to add one here. On mouse enter, same thing. What this ball, what's the verb of this sentence? <coughs> Play animation. Animator. <coughs> Play. And highlight. Control C, Control V. There we go. Save. And check.
Cool. Awesome. So we moused over and it changed colors, but when I moused off, it still stays here. And so we need to go back to here when we mouse off. And so the mouse off or exit is going to be right here. So let's do that. Get on mouse enter play. Ba, ba, ba. Let's see here. No, we're moving off of there, so that's not going to work. I said that one came to exit. So let's not do it that way. We'll do it slightly different. So if we need to get rid of one of these, we can right click on it and delete that one right there. So let's leave it there for now. We're at the very end already. So we've got this graph as of right now. We've got our deep dive into animation. We've got it highlighting. And we've got the ball triggering here when we click on it to actually animate our entire object with our really nice ball bounce. In which way? Uh, where ball stop goes to ball highlight, back goes to ball bounce. Yeah. No, what? No. Uh, not those two. So the on click event should still work. Yeah, the problem is we're sending another event once the ball moves out of our collider there. So let me think about it for Wednesday. But we have a lot to just chew off there as this is. Is it possible that that one is highlighting only just a portion of the frame? Because when I'm looking at it, it looks like most of the animation gets cut off. Like it's getting cut off because the here's the collider, right? And so when we click it, it starts animating. And then the ball goes up. Our mouse stays here. And so when the collider moves away from the mouse, then we get the stop triggered. So that's what's cutting it short right now. Let me think about it for Wednesday. There's a couple different ways we could do it, but let me think about what would be the least clicks for the whole thing. Cool. All right. Everything got recorded. It's all up there. You're going to need to add five pieces of your own art to this scene. 
for Monday. And so you could definitely get started on this, you know, certainly taking the animation deep dive. And then secondly, um, creating, again, what you use to draw your 2D art is fine with me. You could do it in real life and scan it into Photoshop, come out of Photoshop as a PNG, come out of Illustrator as a PNG, Procreate, doesn't matter. Okay, however, everyone has different uh, preferences for that. But you're going to want five of your own sprites to bring in to this project. that go together in some kind of scene here. Sound good? No. Sound good? Awesome. All right, we'll pick it up there on Wednesday.